kind of stand up to read God's word because we want to honor it. We believe it has the power to change our lives. And I'm going to be in Matthew and the 26th chapter um, from the 6th verse of Matthew and chapter 26 um, from the 6th verse. I'm just going to read a few verses and you can follow it through on the screen. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of costly fragrant oil and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, the Bible says they were indignant, indignant, saying, why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. Why? For you have the poor with you always. But me, you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my head, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the power we have to, um, the privilege we have to just sit around your word and learn of you this morning. I pray that you do something really special in every heart here this morning. We come with expectation because we know that your word uh, is life. It's life-given. It just stirs us up from where we are, picks us out right where we are. And I pray, Lord, that you would really do that. Encourage everybody who is discouraged this morning and really just strengthen the weak, Lord. And those who need salvation, God, let them find it. Do what only you can do in this house this morning. We're so grateful for the amazing things you're doing in our lives and in our church. Thank you, Lord, that I get to be married to the most amazing woman in the world. And thank you that Liverpool has already won the league. We don't even need the Watford game. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. 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 Please be seated this morning. If you wasted your time watching Premiership yesterday, that's on you. Um, We already know the champions. There's no point. All right. Fantastic. Um, That's what you do. When you've won the league, you don't need to stress yourself. You're thinking about winning the Champions League and stuff like that. That's good. And nobody must talk about that, okay? We're fine. We're fine. All right. We came to hear the word of the Lord. Didn't you? Wow. Listen, this is the rule. Anytime Liverpool wins, we come, we talk about soccer, then we get into God's word. Um, The once in a year that Liverpool loses, we just don't talk about it. Is that fine? Whatever. So, um, (laughs) it's amazing how people are so excited about, um, but it's fine. It's fine. Um, In this world, you would have tribulations. And so, just to prove that we are real children of God, we just kind of have those one-offs. Um, it's kind of embarrassing, to be honest, but um, today, I want to get straight into the word, okay? Let's just, let's just get into that. No, but, but, but the part that is tripping me is some of the people that are laughing. I'm like, what rights do you have to laugh? That's, that's my concern, okay? But, but, but it's okay. I can only... Anyway, okay, so here we go. I want to speak to you this morning for a few moments on what I would tie to. We don't even have to. We don't even have to. We don't even have to. Quick question. When you write exams, for when you wrote exams, if you're done writing exams, or when you write exams, um, just a quick one. Do you prefer MCQs, that's multiple choice questions, or do you prefer essay questions? Let's see. Who prefers MCQs? Let's check that out. You prefer multiple choice questions? Who prefers essay questions? Wow, Really? I, can't, I think I, I, well, depending on the exam, but, but the good thing with multiple choice questions is that the answer is one of them. So, um, if you have some very mean lecturers, you're looking at the four options and they all look the same, but, but give or take, if you are a man of the spirit, you know, you can, you can kind of look at options and um, start to cancel out the ones that came from the pit of hell. You know what I'm talking about? Or the other thing is um, maybe you have um, what you know maybe you have these code things that you do to pick correct answers. Um, whoever did Adibaba CAC, you know, and then you just um, that was the story of how I wrote my wife, um, um, my wife Yoruba, and to the glory of God, I had an F9, yeah. Um, but it was just Adibaba CAC, Adibaba CAC, just running it all through. Anyway, here we go. So, and the good thing with getting an F9 or an E8 is that an F9 is not recorded on your certificate. But an E8 is recorded. Well, as at then, I don't know how they do that now. 
So the good thing was, ah, they didn't release my results. <laughs> All right, so, so, so I was thinking about that this morning because the scripture we read, um, that we just read this morning, um, we read about this woman coming to Jesus with, with what was like a year's wages. Um, it was worth, the Bible tells us it was worth over 300 denarii. And it was a lot of money, this alabaster, you know, jar. And she comes to Jesus and the Bible says that she breaks it and, you know, pours it. Um, this costly fragrant oil, she pours it on his head as he sits at the table. And, and Jesus' disciples kind of face up to this moment. And there is this thing going on between Jesus and his disciples. And, and the Bible uses this word that Jesus' disciples were indignant. They were like angry and mad and saying, why would you do this? This is waste. And so I kind of feel like this was like an MCQ moment for, for Jesus, his disciples, and the woman. And I'll just show you what, what goes on here. So in a moment, Jesus lifts two options. And then he puts none of the above and then probably all of the above. And so Jesus says, what has just happened? And then option A, we could put worship. Option B, we could put waste. Option C, we could say none of the above. Option D, we could say all of the above. And Jesus' disciples look at that moment and say, this is waste, all right? We pick the option waste. Jesus says, take a good look at worship. Do you think it could be worship? They say, no, we pick the option waste. The woman looks at the options and she says, for me, I call it worship. And today, I'm going to try and show you about our sense of value as we come around moments like this as a family, as a house, I'll, pr I'll try and be speaking for a moment into our sense of value and, you know, what the scripture has to do with that. Because when I grew up, um, growing up, for me, um, one of the things that was kind of a common sight around, around where I grew up was these children from um, another country close by, just across the border. Um, they, they, you would almost think they're jandered until you get a good look. And then they come around begging. How many of you know who I'm talking about? Okay, so they come around begging. And they usually had these encouraging lines that they share with you to encourage you to give to them. Um, apart from the fact that their, their, their one drive was usually that they would pester you until whether out of desire or out of frustration, you know, you would give them something. Who knows what I'm talking about? That's for sure. Okay, we're on the same page. Good. So they would usually come around you and in encouraging you, they have these lines that they start to share with you. One of them was things like, um, Uncle, Auntie, eh, nita moto rakeke? Eh, nita GSM ra calculator? Do you, do you know? It's only me they said things like that. So if you don't know what that means, that basically means that you will not take your car, sell it, and replace it with a bicycle. It's a profound prayer. And then that you will not take your mobile phone, iPhone, whatever you use, sell it and replace it with calculator. Wow. That's, that's a huge prayer, right? It's a huge prayer, people. That you will not say, she be on my phone, is number. On my calculator, is number. Take, do you understand what I'm saying? It's a heart, deep, profound prayer that you will not, um, that, you will, that you will know the power of discernment. Who, who's with me this morning? Come on. All right. And so, so, so I, had, I had this little cousin years ago that I would, I would typically be in this moment with. So she, she, um, she's begging me for a sweet in my hand. And then we are next to a shop where they sell all of this. And then I offer her a thousand naira note or the sweet. Um, for context, a sweet at that time was at best five naira. So I'm telling her, pick between 1,000 and a sweet. And she's crying and screaming. She's probably like a three-year-old, crying and screaming and saying, I want the sweet. And I'm trying to say, no, no, no. Let me hold this sweet, but give you a 1,000 naira. And she says, no. The sweet. Don't deprive me of my destiny. You know, the sweet. She didn't say it in those words, but you get what I mean. And when I think about it, I think that this still goes on till today. Um, this is where, where I'm trying to get to today. I, I just want to encourage us that we would never really lose our sense of value. That as you sit in front of this exam of life and you have these MCQs going on and you have the options to pick from, my, my encouragement is that we won't lose our sense of value. So the first thing I want to show us this morning is how the story of our worship still tells the story of the gospel. And so Jesus is in this moment with this woman in this scripture we read. And then he's telling her that, look, wherever 
this gospel is preached in verse 13, that wherever this gospel is preached, that what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And so Jesus is saying that because this woman picked this moment and said, I call this moment worship, Jesus says that there is great power in how the story of your worship is going to tell the story of the gospel. You know, the woman was in a moment where she thought she was just worshiping. She was in a moment where she thought she was just sacrificing what she could. She was in a moment where she thought, I'm just doing what I know to do. In the presence of Jesus, I'm just responding to Jesus. But it's amazing how Jesus says, you know what? She's actually telling a gospel story. And when I think about that, it humbles me because, you know, the gospel is a real... Um, um, Victor, where are you? Uh, are you? I hope you're not too far. I, I think you should just come and work with me. They're, they're, they're making life hard for me, you know. But, but with you, life gets good. Um, you know it's amazing how the story of our worship is connected to the gospel it still tells the story of the gospel and I encourage you this morning people that we don't undermine what it means to live our lives and say we pick the option worship we choose to be worshippers that we just come around God and do all that we know to do in the direction of God choosing to be worshippers don't undermine it people that the story of our worship still tells the story of the gospel. Second thing I want to say this morning is about the loss of value that calls the big privilege of worship waste. Now coming to this point where suddenly like the disciples, we start to call what God calls worship, we start to call it waste. That how bad have we lost our sense of value. For a little context, would you remember we met this morning that Jesus had 12 disciples, Jesus had 12 guys, Jesus had 12 people that were always with him, that always saw him, that he would explain things to in detail, that would hear him teaching in public and come back and ask him questions. Jesus had 12 people that had the exclusive privilege of being with Jesus. What else would make you value the gospel? Apart from being with Jesus, waking up with him, being with him when the ship was being tumbled on the storm, being with him when he multiplied bread, seeing his part work, seeing him raise the dead seeing him walk on water, he had 12 people that were always with him that saw him speak to the storm that saw him do amazing things if there was anybody that should value Jesus, I think it should be the 12, if there was anybody that should value the privilege of being with Jesus, I think it should be the 12 but suddenly in a moment a woman who had never even been around Jesus broke in and said, I'm doing this and I call it worship. I sacrifice, I give, I do all of this. And the Bible says that Jesus' disciples, Jesus' disciples, Jesus' disciples were indignant. And they said, this is waste. The very ones that I would have thought should have their sense of value right. The very ones that I should have thought would esteem Jesus. The very ones that I would have thought would say nothing we do for Jesus is ever too much. The very ones that have walked with him and seen his power. The very ones that beheld his glory. The glory of the Son of God. The very ones that you think should value it are the very ones who said that word waste. And so they sat in that moment, they looked at the action and then they said, but we call this worship, they cancelled it out and they said, we call it waste. How is it that disciples can come around the Jesus moment and we start to call worship waste? We start to call the resource that goes into worship, we call it waste. We start to call the effort that goes into worship waste. We start to call the moment, the time that goes into worship. That this thing that it costs us to live a life of worship, to live a life in surrender, we call it waste. We start to call the privilege of, of, of being in this God moment, we call it waste. We just think it's a small thing because life is so busy. And can I tell you the truth, friends? We live in a generation that tells us that worship is waste. We live in a generation that tells you that everything you do in a God direction is waste. Why can't you just be young and alive and do your life and just live your life? You only have one life to live. Go for it. Do what you want to do with your life. Spend your time and a degree. Do all of that. Do all the stuff. But the whole God thing looks like waste. We live in a world that is throwing that narrative at us and saying, hey, it's waste. It's waste. But today I pray that we can correct our sense of value. Today I pray that we won't be disciples who, who carry the name of Jesus, who come around the word of God, who come around the life that we received of him and then call it waste. Do we really have to? 
And so we get to these moments where we start to stand in the things that should be a privilege of worship for us. And then we start to ask, do we have to? Do we really have to? Do I have to go to church? Do I, do, do I have to go early to church? Do I really have to contribute? Do I have to give? Do I have to, to sacrifice? Do I have to serve? Do I, do I really have to? It starts to become, do I have to? Because in our estimation, it is a story of waste, not worship. The moment what is supposed to be worship, you call it waste. The truth is your question changes. You start to ask, do I have to? I was in a service on Friday and somebody was preaching and he, he was just sharing a thought and he said these words that just stung on my heart. He said, how do you think the disciples would have felt after the resurrection when they remember that moment? How do you think the disciples would have felt? Jesus said, look, this woman is preparing me for my burial. This woman is seeing a story of the gospel. This woman is seeing the salvation of the whole world. You're talking about a year's wages. Somebody is saying, I'm connected to the story that is changing the world forever. 2,000 year, years down the line, we are still in that story. And one woman was sensitive to pick and the disciple said, it's waste. What do you mean? The whole Jesus thing, it's waste. How do you think they would have felt a few weeks later? When suddenly they realized, man, he died and he rose again. How do you think you would have felt when you looked at resurrected Jesus and you remember I was the one saying that they are wasting things on you? How do you think you would have felt when you looked at Jesus in that moment of conquering the grave and all of that? I feel like many of us want to say, hey, if only I can walk, I will serve you with my own life. Nothing will ever be too much for you, Jesus. I think that's the way many of us would feel when the trumpet sounds. We'll start to look back over a life that we have lived and start to ask ourselves, what were we really doing? What were we really valuing? What was really worth it? Were those things really that high on our sense of value? What was worth it taking me away from Jesus? What was worth taking me away from a place of worship? What was worth it taking my heart? How do you think the disciples would have felt after the resurrection? So what was, do we really have to? We'll start to become, oh, I would have. I would have. I would have. I would have done that when I was 20. I would have done that when I was on campus. I would have done that before I married. I would have done that. I would have. I would have. I would have. And today, I'm, I'm just trying to reach us in this side where we are and say, and say, you know what, friends? We are facing that same question. We would always face that question. Is it waste? Is it worship? Is it waste? Is it worship? We are always going to be facing it. And it's not the two. It's going to be one or the two of them. And I want to remind us today that it's a privilege to be a part of his story. It's a privilege to be a part of his story of the gospel. It's a privilege to be a part of his story of what God is doing. It's a privilege to be able to connect our lives to say, hey, the woman, it was heavy on her and I can only imagine how it weighed to take your earnings of a year. I can only imagine how heavy it weighed. Hey, put it in your own context, friends. Don't just read it as a fancy Bible story. Think of everything you have made over the last one year. By whatever job you do, whatever allowance you get, how you do yahoo yahoo. Think of everything you have made over the last one year. And imagine coming into this moment in this service and just pouring it out in whatever form. So you know it's one thing if you said, oh, you know, we're trying to do a building in church and then you give it as money. That's a little different. But here, you just break it. It's like I'm not even thinking about this. I just break it and let go to Jesus to show you the abandon. And you should probably understand why Jesus' disciples say waste. Listen, let me throw this in. You know, when we come around that language of waste, there is always justification for it. Do you hear the cool line Jesus' disciples throw in? They say, we could have given it to the poor. <laughs> Good Christian line, isn't it? We could have given it to the poor. The poor. People are suffering. The poor. But listen to me well. Nothing that takes your heart away from Jesus is ever a justification. Whether you wrap it around morality, goodwill to man, nothing that takes your heart and your focus away from Jesus is ever a justification. I want you to see the dilemma in that moment. It's a choice between Jesus and the poor. 
it's a choice between it, it's something trying to justify looking away from Jesus nothing that takes your heart away from Jesus is ever justified nothing is ever justified it might look good for a headline but nothing is ever justified it's a privilege to be a part of a story of the gospel Excuse me. And this morning I was just I was just walking a story with myself through a lot of what ifs. What if what if she didn't? What if the woman didn't? What if she didn't break the jar? What if she didn't? The truth is the gospel will still be the gospel. But she will close herself out from something. She will close herself out from the privilege to be a part of a God story. But the gospel would still be the gospel. If she didn't break it, I'll just be preaching to you this morning on another scripture or anywhere. But I'll still be preaching about Jesus. The gospel would still be the gospel. But by what we do, we give ourselves the right to tell the gospel story. We give ourselves the right to connect our lives to the gospel story. I was thinking about what ifs this morning. What ifs? Because for some of you, it's starting to look like waste when God says it is worship. God says, I'm doing something significant in your life. And maybe you're hearing a generation that tells you the word waste. That tells you you don't have to put in that much effort. You don't have to stress yourself. Don't go the distance. I was thinking through scriptures this morning. What if, what if Paul's nephew didn't just go the extra mile to love enough and tell about the danger? In Acts chapter 23, you probably know the story about how in verse 13, the Bible says that these guys came together, 40 guys, and told the, the commander of the council that, look, we bring Paul to you and, and we are ready to kill him before he comes. They said, we have made a vow that we're not going to eat until we have killed Paul. And somehow in that moment, you know, God allowed Paul's sister's son, his, nep his nephew, yeah, to hear about it. And the guy took the effort to run and tell Paul they're planning to kill you. And that was how Paul was able to be, to be, to be carried out through a different route and all of that. But, but I was just thinking about the what ifs this morning. What if he didn't? That would close out to third of your New Testament. If a young boy didn't just do what he could. If a young boy didn't just say, you know what? I happen to be here because God put me here. I happen to hear what I hear because God put me here. And I'll do what I can in a God direction. He opened out to third of the New Testament to you. What if he didn't? What if he said this Uncle Paul gone? Let's even watch the drama and see how it would happen. What if he said this Uncle Paul that the other day I was calling him, he didn't pick my call. He has never sent me pocket money in the last two months. What if he didn't? What ifs? What if the cup bearer didn't tell Pharaoh about Joseph because he was shy? That in that moment, the Bible says, the cup bearer remembered and said, ah, I remember my fault. What if he said, I'm not the kind of person that likes to talk to Pharaoh. Listen, just in a few years, his children will be dying in a famine. He will not know that he had the power to change that. Just in a few years, he wouldn't know that there is a story he is creating by his faithfulness in the moment. He wouldn't know that a whole nation would be like all the other nations complaining and dying because somebody somewhere didn't stand up in responsibility. What ifs? What ifs? Judges chapter 16 verse 26 there's this interesting scripture because we read about Samson and Samson killing more in his death than in his life you read about the amazing power and what God did through Samson against the Philistines but in that moment when Samson's eyes were plucked out in Judges 16 and verse 26 the Bible says Samson said to the lad who held him Judges 16 and verse 26 Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them wow so it was a young lad who was beside Samson that Samson reached out to and said can you please put my hands on the pillars and it was this young boy that put Samson's hands on the pillars so you read about Samson killing more but you don't know Samson could never have done it without the faithfulness of that young boy in the story so is it really a story of Samson killing more Philistines or Samson and the young boy killing more Philistines even if though we never know his name what if he didn't? What if he didn't? What if Moses' sister saw Pharaoh's daughter 
I just decided what's gone should be everybody else is dying and just didn't take the step that she was positioned to take what if she did it can you see how big God's stories hang on hinges faithful moments I read about David going to look for his brothers and the Bible says that David's brothers were not where he thought they would be Joseph De Joseph's brothers and Joseph asked this guy who said I think I saw them go to Dothan you see who's been reading their Bible help me out yes you confirm that oh, I, I, I mixed it up so you get so study the Bible to know to know how you know please be reading your Bibles it's important so sometimes I might just give you something to see do you really know it so when you get back, please go and check. <laughs> yeah, what if? And, I, and as I think about all the what ifs, as I walk through scripture, I could go on and on and on. As I think about all the what ifs, I'm, I'm then trying to bring it home to myself and asking myself about the possibilities that I hold for my wife, for my children, for my family, for my church, for my community thinking about the what ifs for us as a church what if we just don't what if we just don't step out in faith what if we don't do we would never know what is on the other side of this story what if we just stay small what if we just refuse to go there what if what if what if the people who influenced your life didn't do it what if you were not the mentored what if nobody looked out for you I was thinking about this morning what if my parents didn't sacrifice to to invest in my life what if my mentors just didn't take a chance on me? What if that I see as a church, you're all living in the fruit of that. The faithfulness. What if, what if the person, what if the government of Jericho decided that you know what, we want to plant trees all across Jericho. And then they employed somebody and said, you be planting trees. Every two, uh, every 500 meters, plant another tree. Plant another tree. Plant another tree. What if that guy was the kind of guy that would not go to work when he should? And at that point where he was to plant a sycamore tree, he embezzled the money and planted grass and went away. And you would never know that in God's design, one day, Zacchaeus was going to meet Jesus at that point. You would never know. You would come around and say, oh, it's really a bushy area. Bushy area. And you would never know how your faithfulness in the moment is telling a story. And this is what I'm saying, people, that the story of the gospel is told in the story of our worship. It's in our everyday. It's in a life that is poured out to God. A life that would work hard on its job. A life that would honor God in his academics, in his studies, in his business, in what it does. A life that would dream with God. A life that would be faithful in his home. A life that would be faithful in the community. A life that would be lived in a God direction for the honor of God. You never know the story of the gospel that God is hinging on it. You never know. And that's my challenge to you, friends. Because we're going to go through a lot of life and think that all this effort is waste. But I'm telling you today, it's worship. You're going to go through a lot of moments where you feel, do I really have to? Do we really have to? Do I really have to go the extra mile? Do I really have to put everything in this? Have you been there sometimes where God was putting dreams in your heart? And you started to ask yourself, can't I be like everybody else and just live normal? No, you can't. There is a purpose of God upon your life. God's hand is upon you. God has called you for a time such as this. God has placed you where you are. God has anointed you. The hand of God is upon you to tell a story of the gospel through the story of your worship. Don't call it waste. Disciples come so close. They look at the possibilities of God and they call it waste. But today I pray that you would call it worship. I pray that when you wake up tomorrow morning and you say I refuse to be lazy and I'm giving tomorrow my best, I pray you would know this is worship. I pray that when you refuse to just sell out your life and live like somebody that has no values and everybody says yeah, it's too much, you are just wasting your time and wasting your youth, I pray you would say I'm worshipping God with my years, I'm worshipping God with my life, I'm honouring God, I do not call it waste, I call it worship. 
I pray that when you give your resource to God and you look at yourself and the truth is it costs you and it weighs on you. And everybody says, do you really have to? I pray you would hear those words in your heart. It is worship. And it is a story of worship that tells a story of the gospel. God would always carry the weight of the gospel and put it on the weight of worshipers. God would always look out for people that say, I'm living a life of worship and I'm poured out to that. And God would put an amazing story of the gospel on a story of worship. I was thinking about it this morning. Did we have to? Six years ago, we started our church. And I was thinking about how we stand in this new season. Because people six years ago chose to be faithful in a story of worship it wasn't convenient, they didn't have everything they wanted to have, it was a lot of effort to stay in, but the truth is we are standing in this because of the faithfulness of people who stood in their place, who stood in their moment God will always tell a story of the gospel through the story of worshippers it's the faithfulness of generations, there were generations that had to go through all the effort that some of us don't have to go through in this time and season and it's so beautiful but I pray it will be a reminder for us that if we stand in this season we can be creating something new for another generation everything you stand in is because somebody created it for you to walk in do we even know the potential of God do we even know what God is doing through our volunteering and our serving as I look across at Sycamore Kids every week, I'm always asking myself, do we even know the possibilities of what God is raising out of there? Do you know how God is telling a story that would change the world through what's going on in that building? Do we even have an idea of what you can bring to your life group? Do you even have a clue about a story of the gospel and a weight of God that you can bring into your life group? Do you even know the value of your presence in the house of God? Do you even know about what being a member of our church is in God's scheme of things. Do you even know the value of your punctuality when we gather in corporate worship? Do you think that God is just absent-minded about these things? No! I believe that every sacrifice in the direction of worship is telling a story of the gospel. Do you know the power we bring together? Let me prove that to you. All week long, how many of you have had what an amazing time I personally had in worship this morning. It was beautiful. I loved it. My soul was sparked up. But the truth is, I can't create that for myself. Who knows what I'm talking about? You come here every Sunday morning knowing that something happens in that room. But there is something God does when we gather together. Amen? Amen? You come here every Sunday morning knowing that in our corporate gathering there is something beautiful that God commands upon it. There's a blessing. And that tells me that every single one of us that shows up is a part of the anointing in this house. That's what it tells me. So do you know that when you're leaving your house in the morning and going to church, do you know that as you're walking in here, you are not just going to meet the anointed people? Do you know that you are carrying an anointing and saying, I'm a part of what God is doing. I'm a part of a God story. I'm a part of everything that goes on. I may not be a worship leader on the platform, but I'm a worship leader on my seat. I'm creating an experience for somebody. And every time in our gatherings, every Sunday morning, I see it and it humbles me. Every time in our gatherings, we make an invitation and say, who wants to be reconnected to Jesus? And hands begin to go up. Listen to me. It is not about how powerful a preacher is. It is the corporate gathering of God's people. You are a part of that testimony. You are a part of what God is doing. The story of your worship is telling a story of the gospel. And so when on Sunday morning you wake up and your feet feel so lazy and you feel like we go there before they finish. No, sir. Don't deprive a story of the gospel. Get up. Oh, do you hear what I'm saying? David says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. There's an attitude I carry because I know that the story of my worship is telling a story of the gospel. Hmm. It's not waste. It's worship. What if as a church we do not stand to lead the people God sends us? What if we don't stand to take responsibility in our community? What if we don't stand in, in a place of societal responsibility? We would undermine the weight of what God can do. And I believe that every time we can look at our lives and say, I am right now in this moment, in the process of creating something, there's something God and so this morning, if, if anything would help your sense of value, I'll just give you a little, a little cheat line. 
as you write that exam where it's going to be asking you worship or waste come look at two people around you this morning and ask say is it worship is it waste questions should get answers yeah <coughs> is it worship is it waste let, let me give you let me give you a little help that could just help help you in this something really simple for me I'm always just praying that my language will change from have to to get to that my language will change from have to to get to and somewhere in that narrative what the world tries to tell me is waste suddenly receives the power of worship I'll show you what I'm saying you know we can come in here and say oh I have to go to church because it's Sunday or you can come in here and say wow I get to go to church it's Sunday I don't have to, I get to. Every member of our church has to be in a life group. No, every member of our church gets to be in a life group. No, you're not hearing me this morning. If we can change our language from have to to get to, does every Christian have to tithe? I'm like, come on, I get to tithe. You don't understand what I'm saying. It's a statement of how blessed I am. It's a statement that God has increased me, that I can take the first 10% and say, God, I get to do this. I get to give. I don't have to give. I get to do it. I get to love God. I get to serve God. Do I, do I as a Christian, must I volunteer? Listen, I get to do this. What a privilege to live my life serving God. I get to. Do we actually have to? And when we think of how blessed we are, do we actually have to? So, so you're almost even asking yourself, what is the minimum attendance in church that can get me into heaven? And so, for example, if I go one out of three, I'm like, you get to. Do you understand the privilege of our gathering people? Do you understand the privilege to come, to be able to lift up our praise, pray for one another, hear the word of God? Do you know we are living in a blessed life, people? Sometimes I just wish that God could reverse the years on some of you. I just land you in some underground silent church in a communist country where you know have you, I don't know if you've watched some of these these moments where you know to even to even have praises they have to do what they call silent praise so you just move your lips to the tune of your favorite song you can't sing out because soldiers are looking on you every time and so there was this story and I think it was a church in China that a page of a Bible sneaked in somehow they were able to sneak in a page of a Bible a page of a Bible. And so they were passing it around. People were writing it out with their hands so that in case the soldiers catch them and get that page, they can still have a copy of that page of the Bible. Right? They were passing it around, studying it. People were cramming it because we get to have a page of the Bible. And here I am in 2020 Nigeria. Somebody asked me, must somebody read the Bible every day? I feel like beating you. Beating you black and blue. You don't hear what I'm saying. You're like, I have to read my Bible because I'm a Christian. I'm like, you get to read God's word. You get to be empowered. You get to receive life. His words are life. They are spirit and they are life. He gets to stir me up. What are you talking about? I get to. I get to. Everything in your mind that is telling you, must somebody listen to a message? I'm like, you get to. You get to. Must I listen to the preaching of every Sunday? You get to do it. What a privilege. That the Bible says that, that, that the good the source sowed good seed. And as people were living, the Bible says Satan was taking it away from their heart. And I feel for them. The problem is they didn't have the recording. So Satan just took it away. But here you are. Even if he collected, you're going to hear it again. Do you understand what I'm saying? I will hear it. I hear. I hear. When he's tired, he'll say, leave him. Do you understand what I'm saying? I get to. I pray we will not lose our wonder. I pray we will not lose our passion. I pray we will not lose that fire that says we are privileged people. What a blessing. Sometimes we're just a spoiled bunch. What a blessing that we have the life we have. And I get to. I get to be in a life group. Must we always contribute? You get to contribute. You get to talk. You get to be heard. You get to learn. You get to grow with other people. You get to hang out. You get to hang out. Some of you in your boring life. Must somebody attend the meeting? 
I'm like, you get to attend it. Help me look at somebody. Say, you get to, you get to. This life, you get to. You get to. What a blessing. What a privilege. Look at somebody. Say, you're looking like a sports brat. Tell somebody, you're looking or something kind that you can probably say. You get to. You get to. Tim, come. I'm almost done. You get to. Let me drum it in on somebody's ear. You get to be here this morning. I can send you off that seat this morning. You get. Value it. Value it. You get to be here. You get to be in the house of God. You get to worship. You get to have an amazing worship team lead you in worship. You get to. And you guys get to serve us. You get to. Privilege. Liverpool fan. Yeah. Chop it. You get to. Chelsea fan. Why are you smiling? You, you get to have a pastor that loves Liverpool that, that speaks of victory over your life. You get to. You get to. Some people go to churches where their pastor is a Chelsea fan. That's sad. But you get to. You get to. You get to. And my prayer this morning is that in a world that calls it, so we're going to sing, um, I will not be silent and just hear from there. Thank you. And, and, and so in a world that calls it waste, I pray that we would rediscover and we would move that option back. Maybe you came here this morning and in all those boxes you have been shading waste, waste, waste. Where's the option? Waste. How many of you have filled questionnaires before where you already know the answer before you even get there? Undecided, undecided, undecided. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Maybe, maybe that's what it's been like for you. That everything church, everything God just feels like to stand up and live your life. Waste, waste, waste. That nothing is driving you. This morning I pray you would shift it out. Take that eraser, clean it out and come back and say I call it worship. Worship, 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 worship. That I get to have the life I have. Worship, worship. That I get to wake up. Worship. I get to love my wife. Worship. I get to look out for my kids. Worship. I get to go back to that job. Worship. You've been complaining forever. Are you not blessed to have that job? Are you not blessed to have somewhere to go to in the morning? Worship. 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 May we never lose our wonder. May we never lose our wonder. I pray that every time we come in, it will come with that freshness. Listen to me, friends. You know, the truth is this the gospel is the gospel. The power of the gospel is the power of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, it's the power of God unto salvation. It never lost a bit of its power. But the big question to us this morning is whether we would respond to it as worship or would respond to it in a place of waste and so everything that was happening in that moment was the same before Jesus and his disciples and the woman everything happening in that moment was the same but we get to make the choice do we call it waste or do we call it worship do we call it waste or do we call it worship maybe you're here this morning and you have sacrificed a lot in this season that we stand do you call it waste or do you call it worship do you call it waste? Do you ever look over your shoulders in your God journey and say, did I even have to? Or do you just look over your shoulder and say, I am grateful that I got to. I am grateful that I get to. And I pray this morning that as we begin to worship, it's a beautiful thing that we can start it out in this service that you can lift your voice that you can sing out loud unashamed and say this life is the life of a worshipper if I would break the alabaster box I would do it this is a life of a worshipper let the world say waste let the world say you are going again you are doing that thing again you are living for God you are not joining the guys you are not doing what they do you are, you are, you are dry I call it worship I call it worship this is not waste I pray this morning we will rediscover our wonder in the name of Jesus can I pray for you church can I pray for you church father in the name of Jesus I pray this morning that you would put a spark in us again I pray this morning God that you would stir up our sense of wonder towards who you are God we are the disciples that call this worship we call this worship in Jesus name and everybody said amen amen come on let's sing it out this morning
God hear your voice, hears that life. God hears me breaking an alabaster jar. Here is me giving everything. Here is me sold out, God. God here is my Think about that for a minute. Here is that life, God. Maybe there are areas in your life right now you have called waste. Can you allow God to do a correction of your value system in the place of worship? Maybe there are things you have held back. I pray people would break their alabaster jars this morning. I don't know what that is to you. I don't know what's the holding back. Maybe it's a season of your life. Maybe it's a decision. But, but I want the Holy Spirit to be able to reach into your heart this morning and show you. It's not a waste, it's worship. It's not a waste, it's worship. There are decisions people need to take. It's not a waste, it's worship. You get to worship. You get to worship. You get to be connected to the story of the gospel. You get to. And some of your lives are going to have value for the first time. Here's my worship. All of my worship. Receive my worship. All of my worship. I'll sing it one more time. Here's my worship. Because if you don't give Jesus worship, you'll take it somewhere else. You, you, you would put it on something else. You would worship Receive self. You would worship, worship your ambitions. <laughs> all of my worship. Can I pray for you, church? Jesus, I want to pray for people hearing these words and you know where they are. You know what this means to them. God, I really sense in my heart that there are people under the sound of my voice that need to break the alabaster jar. For some people, it's a season of their lives. For some people, it's a mindset. For some people, it's a heart towards you. But God, you know where they are right now. And people need to love you, to really know what it means to love you and to trust you. To know that they can, they can live their lives and pour it out in worship. To know that they can worship you on their job. They can worship you on what they do. They can worship you with their integrity. They can worship you. That they will not be silent. God, I just pray that out of this house this morning, every heart here, would be a heart of a worshiper. I pray, oh Lord God, that where the world has lied to us and has said it is waste, God, I just pray this morning there will be such a radical revelation that will bring a correction and would show us that it is worship, that we will call it worship. We would go out saying, I am a worshiper. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that revelation in every heart. It's worship, it's worship. Uh, Lord, where, where we have said, do we have to? God, help us to change the language that because of Jesus, we get to. We get to. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I'm so grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we all just stay standing? We get to stand in this moment because we want to honor somebody who's making a decision for Jesus. I don't know who you are or how you came about being in church this morning, but I'm going to ask everybody to just bow their heads and close their eyes. And we want to give you a sincere moment to consider your stand with an almighty God. Can you confidently say that you're in a right relationship with God? 
I don't know who you are or how you came about being here this morning, but my big question is, can you confidently say that you're in the right place with God? We believe there's only one way that you can be made right with God. It's through Jesus. He is the one who died so that we can have life. He's the one who can forgive. And we would go around living in the guilt of our sin, except we say yes to Jesus. And so I just want to help somebody this morning. I want to lead you in a moment. If that's you and you say you're speaking to me, I'm far away from God. Maybe you're living in guilt, you're living in shame and condemnation. Jesus loves you. And today can be the beginning of the rest of your life. It can be a new beginning for you. And so I'm just going to count to three. I'm going to ask you to raise up your hand high and unashamed wherever you are. Can we all just bow our heads and close our eyes? And let's give somebody the, the right to make a decision for Jesus this morning. If that's you and you say you're speaking to me, maybe at some point in your life you have made this choice, but as we speak today, you know that you have walked away from it and you want to be made right today. I want to welcome you home this morning. Are you ready? If you say you're speaking to me, I'm going to count to three. Raise up that hand high and unashamed. Here we go. One, two, three. Shoot it up high and unashamed. Let him see you. Let him know you. Wherever you are, I want you to raise it up high and unashamed. High and unashamed. If you're raising up, please keep it up a minute. Please raise it high and unashamed. God bless you if you're doing that. If you're doing that, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else want to join in? If you want to join in, please raise it up. High and unashamed. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Let me give you 10 more seconds. God bless you. It's a new beginning. God bless you. God bless you. I see your hand there. God bless you. It's a new beginning. God bless you. If you raised up your hand, please put that hand on your chest. Can we all say this together? This is a family, not a crowd. The Bible says we believe with our hearts and we confess with our mouths unto salvation. Can we all say this together as we identify with our brothers and sisters who are coming home? Let's say, Heavenly Father, I come to you today because you've made a way for me to come through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of your son Jesus. Say, I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He's the Savior of the world. Say, I confess Him as my Lord, as my Lord and my Savior. And my Savior. See, I give everything, I give everything to, follow you. to follow you. Now say, forgive me of the past. Me of the past. And please give me a whole new start. Whole new say, I will live for you. I will stand for you. Say, fill me with your grace. Fill me with your, grace. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your and I will never be the same. I will say these words boldly. Say, I get to live for you by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm your child. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen.